Thanks, Dave. I, I, I actually have, have to have to comment that when I was halfway through preparing my talk before I realized I was supposed to be arguing pro and not con, because I had a really good con talk ready. <laughs> um, so, uh, Haifu is ready for prime time. I have nothing to disclose except I don't do Haifu. But I'm going to start with the audience response question. I'll start offering Haifu to my patients when a randomized multicenter trial shows efficacy. There's enough literature to support meta-analysis of multiple data sets. My Medicare carrier policies allow for adequate reimbursement, or number D, Dr. Crawford tells me it's okay. So pick your favorite. And the answers. Yeah, it's pretty... <laughs> I had, a feel, I had a feeling that that last one was going to get some, you know, some action. You know, I mean, see, see the re reimbursement is always an issue, and, and that's something that I think everything we, we do, we, we, we've got to acknowledge. Um, a and B, actually, I th I, I'm going to try and show you some, some papers. I mean, there, there is actually more out there than, than you may think. Um, and as Victor Hugo said, nothing else in the world, not all the armies is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. So... Um, the, the point I'm going to try and convince you of is that the time for Haifu has come. And this is really the money slide. Um, I mean, everything else I'm going to have is really in support of this slide. But, you know, we're talking here about a, something that's been in use for more than two decades around the world. It is global. 50, 50 countries do this. It is minimally invasive. It can be either ultrasound or MR guided. Um, there's a number of different systems, transrectal, transurethral. It's an outpatient treatment, has rapid uh, recovery. There's minimal GU and sexual toxicities comparatively. Um, there's no bleeding and there's, there's no radiation to the organs at risk. Um, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of this cartoon I clipped a long time ago from Baby Blues, What Doesn't Kill You Often Makes You Wish It Had. Um, damage to these sensitive organs are often considered unacceptable after the standard prostate cancer treatments, be it radiation or prostatectomy. Um, so there, you know, there's some, some preliminary data out there, uh, uh, some, a pr prospective multi-center uh, HIFU trial. This, this is a trial that I really liked, um, it's, it's, it, and, and I liked it because it's the only prostate cancer trial I've ever seen that reported the median follow-up in days. Uh, here, 407 days. So it's a really short follow-up, um, but but they did negative. They did biopsies in patients in follow-up, which I think is important because most of the studies that are out there, radiation in particular, we don't do biopsies. Um, and and so 87 percent overall, 90, 92 percent low-risk patients had negative biopsies uh, in follow-up. Um, there's toxicity that shows a slight but increased, uh, slight but insignificant increase in epic urinary sores, a, a trend towards decreased sexual, a trend, but not, you know, this is not, not even a big deal kind of uh, uh, sexual toxicity. Um, and, and so we, we think that both from the eff efficacy, from the toxicity, there's, there's some data to, to support it. Um, in the salvage setting, I think that there's a lot more data. There's whole gland HIFU. Uh, again, 81% one-year negative biopsies with some, some toxicities, most of which were grade one and grade two. So I think that, that it is a tool that belongs in your armamentarium. We've got other studies that have done longer follow-up. Here we've got uh, uh, one with a, almost, almost uh, uh, four years of follow-up median. Um, 569 patients. One of the nice things about this is it, it is repeatable. If you, if, you, if you don't take care of the problem the first time around, uh, it can be done. They had 163 patients where they safely were able to retreat. Um, Five-year failure-free uh, of 70%, of but there's a fair number of high-risk patients in there and in the high-risk population, 58%. It's actually not that different than what we see with a lot of uh, other modalities. Um, relatively low risk of, of complications, 88% um, pad free, 7% UTIs. And if, if a urinary tract infection is one of the major complications that has to be reported, it actually is a pretty safe treatment, something that we should be thinking about. Um, a thousand patients in another study, um, 
again, two thirds of them were single, single session, third of them required multiple sessions, mostly low and intermediate uh, uh, risk patients with fairly good um, eight-year biochemical control using the Phoenix definition. It's never really been tested in the non-radiation setting, but it, it's a reasonable definition to use. But importantly, prostate cancer specific survival of 97% at 10 years and metastasis free survival of 94% at 10 years. The graph kind of shows you what we're, what we're talking about visually as, as it relates to the biochemical control. Um, and there's more late results. This is a, another study, 700 patients. So now if you're, if you're doing the math, we're, we're talking thousands of patients in the studies that I've just presented to you. Um, th some of these were patients with, that were fairly high risk. I mean, they're, they're low stage, but some of them were fairly high uh, uh, PSA. Again, two-thirds of these intermediate or high-risk patients. Median follow-up is now fairly long, five and a half years. Um, Cancer-specific survival, 99%. Um, freedom from salvage treatment, 98% uh, in the low-risk group, 72% intermediate. And 10-year metastasis-free survival, 95%. Almost exactly what I just reported, uh, what I just uh, read, showed you from the last trial. And almost exactly what you know is going to happen in, in patients that are randomized in the PROTECT trial to have treatment or no treatment. And that's about the disease free, freedom from disease progression that you're going to see with patients treated with standard of care radiation therapy and radical prostatectomy or radical prostatectomy. So I, I, I think that, that, that there's more and more data piling on. Large studies, longer follow-up, again, another 500 patients thrown in there, median of eight years. Again, the low risk don't, don't look like they're doing too well, but, the, but they aren't doing any worse than with other therapies. But the intermediate and, and low risk patients doing very well. Multi-center trials um, are, are now available with long-term follow-up. There's a meta-analysis. Most things that, you know, by the time there's a meta-analysis, you've got a fair amount of data out there. You've got a number of, uh, number of studies that can be compiled. Um, and again, 14% of the patients in this meta-analysis required subsequent oncologic therapy. Turn that around, 86% of patients treated with HIFU don't need any subsequent oncologic therapy, which I think is a win. There's a number of clinical trials that are ongoing trying to de develop more knowledge base about this, what, this standard treatment, um, but, the, but the fact that there are clinical trials ongoing doesn't mean we don't, don't know enough to be offering it. It just means that there are still questions uh, as there are with surgery, as there are with radiation. Case selection becomes the key with anything we're doing. Um, this, is, this is a great opportunity to treat focally when whole gland treatment is not indicated. Uh, it is a great tool for those patients who need a bridge between active surveillance and more aggressive, potentially toxic treatments. Um, and so it's, it is something that, that we should be thinking about when we meet this, uh, this FDA vague approval for prostate ablation. I was struck that were really where we were with brachytherapy just 20 years ago. This is, this is a new and exciting treatment. Um, this is a slide that I put together in uh, around 1999, 2000. The little red bars show the utilization of brachytherapy, 1992 through 1996. And you can see it was an up-and-coming treatment. It was something that was still less than 5% less than of all prostate cancer treatments. Um, but that's about where we are now with the HIFU. Um, we didn't know exactly what technology to use. We didn't know exactly what technique to use. This is from 2001, article by Dr. Rodriguez. Looking at, at brachytherapy doses, we didn't know what was the right dose. Well, that's exactly where we are with HIFU. We don't know which technology. We don't know which technique. Um, but clearly, we're, we're moving down the same path. This is what we now know with, with uh, LDR brachytherapy. The data is solid now. It takes time for this to develop 20 years later. Um, I will also tell you we all have our own media um, uh, uh, 
issues that, you know, similar to brachytherapy. The, on the left, some of you remember Andy Grove when he published his brachytherapy experience in Fortune magazine. On the right, uh, the Daily Ma Mail with uh, Wyman from the Rolling Stones, uh, who, as, as you can read there in the headline, if you can read it, keep your pecker up, Bill. New prostate cancer zapper won't wreck your love life. So clearly, this is the 2017 version of what was done with a little more civility, perhaps, in, uh, in, in the 1990s. But brachytherapy uh, seems to be the model that, uh, that is the trajectory that is being followed by this. And when does a standard, a new treatment become a standard of care? There's really no right answer to this. Um, the National Academies of Medicine, which uh, 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 previously was the, uh, um, uh, um, yeah, right, that. Um, <laughs> Had a, had a panel that was convened a couple of years ago, appropriate use of advanced technologies in radiation therapy and surgery. They were looking primarily at IMRT and about uh, a radical, robotic radical prostatectomy, but they could have been talking about HIFU. The bar now for these new technologies is higher. We've got to acknowledge it. But we've got hypothesis-generating studies. We've got multicenter studies. We've got meta-analysis. We've got a treatment that is widely available both across the U.S. and worldwide. Um, and that brings me to my final slide, this uh, uh, do you need coffee? Um, and, and, and I like the algorithm here. This is, doesn't help you solve prostate cancer, but it does ask the very simple question, are you Batman? If the answer is no, you need coffee. Uh, if the answer is yes, you're a liar and you need coffee. So, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and hopefully I've convinced you that Haifu is here to stay.